A Journey to the Center of the Earth, Chapter 9, The Central Sea. When I regained consciousness, I found myself lying on some thick sleeping rugs. I groaned and opened my eyes to find my uncle gazing at me with tears in his eyes. He lives, he lives, cried my uncle. Yes, my good uncle, I whispered. At that point, Hans joined us. Good day, he said. Where are we, uncle? I asked. What day is this? What happened? It is eleven o'clock at night on Sunday, August 9th, my uncle answered. Your head is bandaged and you need to sleep. I will tell you everything tomorrow. As my eyes closed, I realized that my dangerous adventure in the interior of the earth in total darkness had lasted four days. When I awoke the next day, I began to look around me. The cave floor was a soft, silvery sand, and the ceiling was adorned with magnificent stalactites glittering in all the colors of the rainbow. Though no torch lit the cave, light seemed to be coming from somewhere. I even imagined I could hear the sighing of the wind and the breaking of waves on a beach. Of course, all that was impossible, for we were 100 miles below the surface. Was I dreaming? Or had some great crack in the earth brought the wind and the sea to me? Or had my uncle given up his expedition and carried me back to the surface? I was puzzling over these questions when my uncle joined me. Good morning, Harry, he said. You are looking better. Hans has treated your wounds with his own special ointment, and they are healing marvelous, marvelously. Now would you like to eat? For the first time in days, I was hungry. And as I ate, my uncle explained that my fall had brought me down an almost vertical tunnel, along with a rock slide, slide right into, this ar into his arms. It is indeed a miracle that you are alive, he said. We must never separate again. I looked at my uncle in astonishment. The journey, then, was not over. But haven't we returned to the surface, I asked? Certainly not, he replied. Then I must be mad, for I see daylight and I hear the wind and the waves. My uncle smiled. You see and hear correctly, he said. I cannot explain, but you must see for yourself. Let us go, I cried, eager to satisfy my curiosity. Just a moment. Do you feel well enough? After all, the wind is quite rough, and you must be strong for your sea voyage. My sea voyage, I cried. You will see. You must be ready to go on board by tomorrow, and it may be a long trip. Go on board? What and how? My curiosity had to be satisfied, so I rushed from the cave. At first, I could not see anything because my eyes were not accustomed to the light, and I was forced to close them. When I reopened them, I stood stupefied at the scene. The sea! The sea! I cried. Yes, said my uncle, the central sea, as I have named it. It was quite Quite true, the sea spread before me as far as my eyes could see. Its shore was made up of soft golden sand, sprinkled with shells. Waves broke on the shore with a murmur of sound found only in underground places. Back from the beach, huge rocky cliffs rose higher than my eyes could see. Above my head, gases formed thick clouds, partially concealing the granite roof that I knew was miles above my head. Yet from between these clouds shone an, an unusually beautiful ray of light, not like the sun, for it gave off no heat. We were in some gigantic cavern, more wonderful than any I had ever read about. It left me speechless. My uncle and I strolled along the beach, breathing in the salt air, after 47 days of dark tunnels. Beautiful waterfalls leaped down the rocky cliffs and disappeared into the sea. After we had gone about 500 yards, we turned a sharp bend and found ourselves close to a huge forest. The trees, shaped almost like umbrellas, stood tall and motionless, despite the strong breeze. I could identify most of the 2,000 known trees in the world, but I had never seen any quite like these before. We went towards the forest. When at last we reached it, I found that I stood not in a forest of trees, but in a forest of giant mushrooms. The white mushrooms stood nearly 40 feet high, with tops spreading 40 feet across. We walked on and found new wonders with every step. 
ferns as big as pine trees, giant grass, and trees as tall as a hundred feet in height. Astonishing! Magnificent! cried my uncle. These speci specimens, which are only small plants in our garden today, were all mighty trees when the world began. If this is true of plant life, would it not also be true of animal life? I asked, looking around anxiously. Yes, my boy. Just look at the bones up ahead on the beach, some as gigantic as trunks of trees. I stooped down eagerly and examined the lower jawbone of a mastodon and the molars of a dinotherum. You are right, I cried. These mighty animals once lived and died on the shores of this underground sea. Is it possible? Oh, my God, that one of these huge, huge monsters may be hidden behind one of these mighty rocks at this very moment? I looked around, but nothing alive appeared of these deserted shores. Even though I had seen many exciting things, I was tired from my recent ordeal and found it necessary to rest, especially if we were going on a sea voyage soon. So we returned to the cave. The next morning, I awoke completely refreshed. I took a bath in the waters of the sea, had breakfast, and then again walked along the shore with my uncle. Where are we now in relation to the surface, I asked him. We are over 1,000 miles from Snuffles and 110 miles under the surface, he said. Then it would put us, let's see, somewhere below the Scottish Highlands, I answered. You are quite right, he said, laughing. Are you now planning to return to the surface, I asked. Go back, he cried, before we finish our journey? But we have reached a great sea, I said. I judge it to be only about 150 miles across, he replied. And how are we to cross it? I asked with some alarm. Swim? You shall see, he said. And I did. Thanks to Hans's hard work, a raft had, he had built a raft 10 feet long and 5 feet wide. It was made of fossil wood from the pines and firs that Hans had found and tied together with our sturdy climbing ropes. A mast stood upright, and hanging from it was a sail made from one of our sheets. At six o'clock on the morning of the 13th of August, we loaded our supplies on the raft and pushed it into the sea. Hans had fashioned a rudder, and he guided us with ease. As the wind was strong, we made good time in the first hours afloat. We passed gigantic clumps of seaweed, three to four thousand feet long, they looked like snakes stretching beyond the horizon. After a few hours, Hans baited a hook with a little piece of meat and dropped it into the underground sea. Were there fish in these waters? We waited a long time. Then suddenly Hans pulled up his line. On the hook was a fish much resembling a lake sturgeon, but of a family that had been extinct for ages. A blind fish that had absolutely no eyes. In this way, we got much needed food for our future travels. The second day at sea, we found the wind steady and the raft moving as quickly as before. We were becoming bored with the trip and impatient to find the other end of the vast sea. My uncle was scanning the horizon with his telescope, muttering angrily to himself. What's wrong, uncle? I asked. I thought this sea would be only 150 miles across but we have already traveled three times that distance, and we are not nearing any land. I am beginning to wonder if Sakasum found this sea and crossed it. I wonder if we are still on the right path to the center of the earth. We sailed on like that for two more days. The only excitement came when trying to find the depth of the sea, Hans tried a crowbar to a, tied a crowbar to a rope and dropped it into the water. It came up half crushed with big scratch marks on it. What are those marks? I asked. Hans looked closely. Teeth, he answered. I decided that I never wanted to see the huge animal with teeth so strong as to crush iron and leave such marks on it. On Tuesday, the 18th of August, we moved as before. Towards evening, I fell asleep, only to be awakened when the raft was lifted high out of the water. What is it? I yelled. Hans raised his hand and pointed to a huge black mass moving in and out of the water about 200 yards from the raft. A colossal monster, I cried. Yes, cried my uncle, and over there is a huge sea lizard. 
And there, closer to the raft, a giant crocodile with teeth at least a foot high. Then an enormous whale appeared. Then, forty-foot-long turtles and other huge monsters, all heading toward us, ready to destroy our raft with a movement of a tail or a bite of a mouth. I picked up my rifle, ready to shoot, but Hans stopped me. A bullet would have no effect on the armor scales covering their bodies. Then all but two disappeared into the sea, and those two made a rush at one another. One had the head of a lizard, the teeth of a crocodile, and the snout of a porpoise. It was the most fearful of all primitive reptiles, the Ichithorosaurus, or great fish lizard. The other was a monstrous serpent with the hard shell of a turtle. It was the terrible Plesiosaurus, or sea crocodile. As we watched, the two giants began a furious battle that lasted for hours. Mountains of water dashed over our raft and nearly hurled us headlong into the waves. Hideous hisses from the monsters brought terror to our hearts. Suddenly, the two disappeared beneath the waves, almost drawing us into a whirlpool they left behind. Several minutes passed. Then the head of the Plesiosaurus rose out of the water, its serpent-like neck twisted in the agony of death. Its body convulsed, then stopped, and the mighty snake lay dead on the now calm waters. After the Ichthyosaurus had gone under the sea to rest, or would he reappear to destroy us? End of chapter 9.